still have a relationship with Dr. Guy Fisher? Oh, yes, man. Um, Guy Fisher is like a pops. You know what I'm saying? Like, he's just like a, you know, the same relationship I had with Alpo I had with him. You know, it was just from a different perspective, father-son type relationship. Um, you know, right now I'm helping him put together his book and a few other things that he got going on. And he got, he got a major project coming out where you're going to hear him speak and him do what he's doing. And, you know, um, me and Guy, we come from the same neighborhood, as I told you. And we have the history and he knew my dad and... Um, which is a whole story which you guys will read in my book, my personal book. You guys will read that story uh, with my family and Guy and, and our neighborhood that we come from. But um, the same relationship that I had with Alpo, I had with Guy. And in my book, I wrote about it, how Guy and Alpo was on the same compound in um, Pennsylvania in the federal uh, program, I mean, penitentiary out there. And um, for five years straight, I went to see Guy Fisher on Saturday, and I went to see Alpo on Sunday for five years straight every month. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I used to surprise those guys. Like, it would be a Christmas or Thanksgiving, and nobody was coming to see them, and I would just pop up. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and this is the things that made us close. Now, Guy had nothing to do with Alpo. They was in two separate buildings, and I kept those situations totally separate. You know what I'm saying? I never infringed upon the relationship as I put in the book on on Guy that I had with him. And Guy understood my position because he was like, son, just go be a journalist. Do what you're doing. That's your job. You're a civilian. Do what you do. Um, so that was like, that was probably one of the highlights of, you know, my career and doing what I'm doing with Street Stars because I would just, you know, another thing that I learned and going to see somebody in a maximum penitentiary and somebody all the way and hidden in the back in a witness protection program was when a man is put in a certain situation, that choice is going to always be down for them to make. Because I hear people say, yo, that rat, the snitch, or this nigga's a stand-up guy. I hear that, but I saw it with my own two eyes personally for five years straight every two weeks when I went to see two total opposite worlds and Saturday I went here and Sunday I went there and I was able to see and go wow sometime I would say to myself or I would think for people and go what decision would they make because I'm witnessing two situations and that was always deep to me right you know what I'm saying because um I could understand Alpo perspective and I was able to understand God's perspective and um, like I said, I never crossed those two paths. You know what I'm saying? So um, to this day, you know, me and Guy is close. We speak at two or three times a day. And like I said, he, you know, he's up next with what he's doing. He has a, a, a monster project coming out. And, um, you know, it's just like a father-son relationship. You know what I'm saying? And when I say father-son, meaning like every man needs a mentor. And, you know, he's that for me. Life after Alpo. Can we expect more Troy Reed documentaries, more Troy Reed productions? Um, you ain't came out in a minute. The book, I believe that's your first piece of media in a minute. Do you plan on returning back to? Um, as far as like the street stuff, I probably wouldn't do. I think like yourself and so many other people, a couple other people out there and um, got amazing platforms. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and this younger more zealous for it, you know what I'm saying? And this is why in my book, I put in the acknowledgement page, um, I acknowledge a number of different digital platforms and bloggers and- You acknowledge um, too many, go um, ahead. Um, and and I, I'm catching flack for it from, from <laughs> different people. But once again, I explain to people that I'm just proud of black media. Right. So I'm not looking at, once again, a semantic of Big eye, little you, why him, why not me? I just look at it as just black media. And from that perspective, that's why I acknowledge as many people as I can get on the page and to the rest of everybody else. So I personally wouldn't probably do another street documentary or none of that. I think you guys have the platform to do amazing things and become actual networks. Um, but what I'm doing is something a little bit 
you know, different that I want to get into. So, um, you know, I'm just going to follow that path. And the only other thing that I may bring out is just a Street Stars book is a, a part two of this Alpo thing, a closure of it, of everything that I ever did and all the amazing travels and stories. And, uh, you know, a little bit of what I touched on this about how I even started Street Stars and the doors I had to kick down or open up to, to convince corporate America about. So, um, me personally, I probably wouldn't do no more, you know, street documentaries. I'll leave that up to you guys and get busy and do what y'all doing best. Do you think you um, convinced corporate America after that initial time when you went and dropped all that media magazines on a, on a desk to now? Do you think, do you feel that you um, accomplished anything? Oh, yeah. I don't, I didn't receive the residuals from it, but I definitely, what I saw at six years old, watching 18 Park, being in the streets hustling from 17 to 24, that vision became reality. And I, when I watched the first 48, when I watched the History Channel Gangland, when I saw American Gangster, the TV show, when I watched uh, American Queens, or I watched any of the street stuff, this content that corporate America gave me hell for and said they would never do, it was interesting, it was too minute, it was too small. Um, when I watched this stuff, I'm always like, wow. And then what, gets me the most is YouTube has resurfaced this world again. And you guys have resurfaced this world again. So it's kind of like, wow. You know, so I get it that way. But um, me, myself, is just kind of like, um, it's time to do something different for me. I'm in a right. different stage of my life. Different reciprocals. Um, civil rights leaders. Inventors, athletes, we want some more Troy Reed, man. You got to figure out something, man. <laughs> Straight up. Yeah. Um, how long did it take to put together the book? Let's talk about the book briefly before we get up out of here. Uh -huh. Oh, the book took me five to six months. You know, when when Poe died, I was already emotionally charged, so it was easy to sit down and just like sit in a house and lock in. It was winter time. It was easy to sit in a house and lock in, and I got. 16 years of visits, friendships, relationships, dialogue, conversation, good times. Um, that was so easy to just write. And actually, it was so much more I could have put in the book. But I was I was up against time because, I, you know, I from a business perspective, it was like I needed to release this book. And if I would have had more time, if I would have took a year to do this book, it would have been even better and juicier. But... Um, from a business perspective, I knew I needed to get this book out and stuff. So, and right now was the time. So, um, you know, it, 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 it took me six months, which I hear is a fair amount of time to do a book. So it was my first one and I got one last one coming, but that's it. All right, let's talk about the title. I never met Alpo. Were you separating Alpo and Albert as two different people, two different personalities? Oh yes. Explain. I got it. The reason I named the book I Never Met Alpo was because I never met Alpo. I didn't. I met Alpo one time, and it's in the book when I was about 17 years old, 18 years old, and I met him up in a park up in the Bronx. But outside of that, I never met the character Alpo. When I went on a visit, like I say, he was 14 years in, and he was a reformed individual. He was there was no sight of Alpo when I went to see him. And that 10 years, because he did 24 years, I did that last 10 with him. He was a different person. And the people that I know that was in there with him, that's now home as well, when we speak, they'll be like, yo, T, Alpo wasn't no gangster in, the, in, the, in, the, in, in that joint. He wasn't no tough guy in that joint. He was just being Alpo. He was just, he was just being Albert. And as I was writing a book, I remember I kept getting mixed up because I was talking about Alpo. Then I was like, nah, I want to talk about Albert. And that's what made me come up with the title because I had to separate the two. Because I know I had to talk about the character Alpo, but most of everything, 95% of the book was about Albert and how this relationship that I had with Albert. So that's what made me come up with the title of the book, I Never Met Alpo. Because that was my, that's my truth, that I never met Alpo because I didn't see that guy nowhere in sight. And the only glimpses that I had of Alpo was in the last year and a half before he died. That was the only glimpses that I was getting back 
of Alpo because he was cursing. He was short tempered. He was very short patient. He was he was frustrated. He was willing to he was doing things that was like, okay, this must be Alpo. And I didn't really care to know that person. So that's why me and him was our brotherhood was there, but our relationship was strained, which is basically explains that in the whole book. But Albert, amazing dude. I will never meet another person like that, me personally, again. Were you shocked that he even entertained the thought of hustling again? There was a chapter in your book when you spoke about him thinking about jumping back, jumping into the weed game, I believe. Um, I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't shocked when he started hustling or getting back into doing whatever he was doing because it was gradually happening. It was like, it wasn't like an instant thing. Yo, this nigga's on the block. This nigga hustling. No, it was a, it was a gradual, it was gradually. And as he started moving more that way, I started moving more this way. So I wasn't even really around it. Yeah. I didn't see it. I was hearing, I was, sound was traveling. Right. And then now, Albert, when I get in the car with him, we would be together the whole day. Now it's, yo, little bro, I'm going to go with you, do this real quick, and then I'm going to drop you off. See, the, 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 it was changing. See what I'm saying? He, he wasn't going to take me around what he's doing or, or certain people he's dealing with. Right. So it would be, yeah, little bro, I'm going to get back with you when I'm coming back across the bridge. Right. So that's how it was gradually changing. So, you know, I didn't really see it, but I knew what was going on. And, um, you know, I, I, I disapproved of it. Does intuition tell you that he returned to being an actual hustler? Oh yeah, we fought. We had, we had, well, no, we fought. We, we verbally, not, you know, like brothers. You yeah. know, we, 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 Poe, like I say, he let me speak my mind. Always. Right. There was no holding back with him. He would say, you finished? Let me speak my piece now. And then he would go. So, I always express him. I don't know no other way to be with no man, with no man I'm around. You're never going to be around me with that buffoonery, that nonsense. So, I spoke my mind to him, and um, he, he, we, he, you know, I was a bugaboo to him. Mm -hmm. His last year, he was alive because he don't want to be around somebody that's gonna tell him something. So he just kind of like, ah, I catch up to you, little bro. I catch up to you. So that's how that's that was our relationship. I catch up to you, little bro. I call you back, and, and he used to have me laughing because once I started that preaching to him, the phone just go like this. And I'd be like, yo, you there? And he's just bust out laughing. He'd be like, I call you back, little bro. Click. And that's how he did me. You know what I'm saying? Because he he didn't want to hear that. He didn't want to hear that.